Hello and welcome to the sunny streets of Tupelo, Mississippi. Uh, man, it's beautiful here. I've actually never been here. I'm super excited because my first stop is the Tupelo. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> man, I was nailing that one too. I'm Eric Baker. You may know me from Tennessee Uncharted, but now I'm expanding my horizons to explore the entire Tennessee Valley. And I'm bringing my friend Ariel Nicole along for the ride. While sometimes we'll journey together, other times not. We hope to take you to places you never knew existed or where you've always dreamed of going. If you've never been to Northeastern Mississippi, you're missing out on a unique and rich intersection of history, architecture, commerce, and culture. While exploring the Magnolia State's mix of urban and rural landscapes, it's clear that they are certainly proud of their past, but also excited to share their bright and vibrant present. During the Great Depression, it was one of the poorest regions in the country. In 1933, Franklin D. Roosevelt's Congress created the Tennessee Valley Authority to help boost the economies in the valley, and Tupelo became the first city to purchase TVA power. Oh, and Elvis was born here. Hello, and welcome to the sunny streets of Tupelo, Mississippi. Super excited, this is my first time in Tupelo, and for my first stop, I'm going to the Tupelo Hardware Store, where Elvis bought his very first guitar. So, uh, let's go check it out. Hey there, how are you? Are Hello. you Connie? I am Connie. I'm Eric. Eric, nice to it meet you. It is nice to meet you. Tupelo wow. Hardware. I can't believe I'm here. I'm super excited. <laughs> the store here has been family owned by the Booth family since 1926, fourth and fifth generation now. And they built this building in 1941. Elvis and his mother came in on his birthday when he was turning 11 years old to get a birthday gift. That was in 1946. All right. Elvis saw a bicycle in the window out front. He wanted, but his mother refused to let him have it. They probably didn't have the money. Mm. But they had a close family friend that worked here about 22 years, Mr. Forrest Bobo. Okay. Mr. Bobo's wife was related to the Presley family. So he knew Elvis from the time he was born. And at that time, this counter was the music counter. Okay. So Mr. Bobo is actually the one that reached in and took out that guitar, handed it to Elvis, said, well, Elvis, how do you like the guitar? And we say that he turned to his mother and said, that's all right, Mama. I'll take the guitar. And the rest uh, is history. What is amazing is within these four walls, the course of history for music was changed, changed forever. forever. I see over in the corner there, you've still got guitars over there. Absolutely, and, come on. You know, for the future Elvises <laughs> of Tupelo. Well, I've right? got a pink one. I'm waiting on the next Taylor Swift. Oh, all right, all right. Ooh. That's my color, I think, actually. <laughs> What is it about Tupelo you think that influenced Elvis? But Elvis um, came from such humble beginnings. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were very, very poor. Mm -hmm. And he never forgot. I think he loved his home here in Tupelo. His heart was here in Tupelo. Absolutely. And never left. Now I gotta get like some nuts and bolts to make my purchase <laughs> official. A guitar and some nuts and bolts and my trip to Tupelo Hardware is complete. Will be complete. Exactly. All right, All Eric, right. Thank, thank you. you. Absolutely. Thank you. Local attorney Guy Mitchell has graciously agreed to show me around town. And it seems he's an Elvis fan as well. So these Sorry. are the sunny streets of Tupelo, huh? Welcome to Tupelo. Thank this you, man. It's beautiful downtown Tupelo. It right looks here. amazing. It looks amazing. There's a lot of action going on here, too. A lot of action. It's a great little town. Yeah. So where's our first stop? First stop will be right in front of what used to be the Mississippi Alabama Fairgrounds. When they were utilizing this area for urban development, they said, we need to remember what it was like and we need some recollections that would be meaningful for people. And they took some of the brick from the old grandstand where they had many a concert, but Elvis's kind of homecoming concert in 1956 and made this entrance to the Fair Park District. There's a nice Elvis bronze over here commemorating the uh, concert in the fairgrounds. 
you were there, right? I was there. I was 12 years old. We were let out of school. I mean, it was a, it was a 2 o'clock in the afternoon concert. Yeah. Okay? And my parents let me go with some of my friends. And we went, and we had seats right down front. We were just excited that Elvis was coming. Right. And Elvis comes out on the stage, and the place just erupts. I mean, it's just women screaming, yeah. rushing up on the stage, scared me half to death. I'd, <laughs> I'd never been to a, a rock concert before. Yeah. And it was terrific. And oh, there man. he is, the king. Oh, man, I got to get a picture of that. <laughs> that is awesome. So cool. Man. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> that was my worst Elvis. That was the worst Elvis face ever. This is not Graceland this by is, any means. This is not Graceland. You're, <laughs> you're exactly right. This is though. Elvis was born in this house. Amazing. And it's in the same spot that it was in. His dad had uh, had built this house with materials. It cost a little over $130 for the materials to build it. It's two rooms, there's no indoor plumbing. There was an outhouse. And he grew up the first 13 years of his life here. Right here. Right here. When you talk about the roots of the king. Yes. This is it. This is it. I mean, we're right at the very beginning. The Church of God Church, which you can see right back up through here, a little white yeah. building, is yeah. the church that Elvis's family went to. It's a fascinating story. I mean, he buys his guitar down at Tupelo Hardware. Yeah. He brings it home. He's having trouble learning how to play. His mother says something to the minister of the church. He said, let me teach him how to play the guitar. So he teaches him how to play the guitar. Elvis's first public appearance, if you will, was in the church, invited up front, and he played Jesus Loves Me, and the congregation sang along. Wow. And so it's an amazing story, if you think about it. Man, this is so cool. This feels good, man. It does. This feels it does. good. It does. You can almost feel the vibe. I can definitely feel it. I, I'm feeling a, a song coming on right now for sure. I love it. Elvis Presley. So cool. All right. Let's, let's go. Let's do it. Let's go. This is great. This is actually life size. They had a school picture of Elvis in the sixth grade. Okay. He wore dungarees. Yeah, that's his hair, that's where his hair was yeah. combed. You shake his hand, that's a, that's a great photo op. People from all over the world come over and shake his hand. Oh man, shaking hands with the king. <laughs> Boy, you have no idea what, what, what is in store for you, my friend. That is awesome. It is a pleasure, it truly is. Nice to meet you. Now give me a high five. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, a lot of fun. Guy, thank you so yeah, much. Thank as, you. As this sign that says, you are welcome. I feel like everybody's welcome here in Tupelo. Everybody's welcome. In Tupelo. <laughs> and thank you for making us feel so welcome. Uh, it's good. Thanks, thank y'all. Appreciate it, man. Thank y'all. Just 50 miles north of Tupelo, Corinth, Mississippi also has an electric history. It was here where federal officials tested out a business model where electric power cooperatives owned by the customers would distribute electricity in rural areas. It's also home to the oldest drugstore in the state. Welcome to Corinth, Mississippi, everybody. Today we are at Borum's Drugstore, and I'm about to go in and try one of their famous slug burgers, which going by its name sounds pretty interesting. Let's go have a taste. How's it going? Uh, doing fine. Lex Mitchell, how you nice doing? Nice to meet you. I'm Eric. Eric, nice to What's meet you. What's your name? Lex Mitchell. Lex. Lex. All right, Lex. man. All right. This is your place, right? That's it. Okay. And my mother's. That's exactly right. All right. I feel like I've course. stepped back in time here. Yeah, it's been here a long time. It's your I like house. it. Yeah. So I'm here to try the slug burger. Okay. Well, let's try one. You want to try it? I do. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You want to go back here and we'll cook us one? You okay. Want to? Come on. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. What we normally do, we, right. we freeze ours. Okay, let me see the patty. Do you mind bringing that back? No. What, what all we got? This one's got pork in it, and okay. it's got an extender in it, whether it be sardines, whether it be grits, or whatever. They put different things in them. Okay. It's got, got an extender in them, and they put a little bit of meat in them, and they were done during the Depression. All right. Because meat was rare, supposedly, but before my time. So when you say extender, make the meat. Yeah, make it make it where to go. Make yeah. it last a little make bit last, longer yeah. or whatever. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's do this, man. All right, let's try it. All right. 
So is this a, something that's special just to Corinth or something? It is to this area, northeast Mississippi, in this corner. Okay. Yeah. So Slug Burger, just by its name, I'll be honest, doesn't sound super right, appetizing. Slug, slug Burger, was it sold for a nickel. Oh, okay. That's right. when it first started, and they sold for a nickel. A nickel so was a known nickel as a slug. slug. Yeah, called ah, slug. okay. All right. It typically comes with mustard, onion, pickles. Is that what you want? Yeah, man. All I right. want it exactly how it's supposed to be. So. Okay. All right. Ooh. All right. Slug burger. Let's do this. All right, let's go. Can we go sit down and yeah, uh, give, it a, right give, it a, give it a taste? Give it a taste. See how you like it. Here's my, uh, here's my first bite of a slug burger. <laughs> it's different. Got a little crunch to it. Mm-hmm. Nice texture with the onions and the pickles. Mm -hmm. You like it? I do. It's good. Pretty good. I'm all right with the slug burger. <laughs> I was a little skeptical. You're going by the right. name or whatever. Right. I know what you make. Something special is happening here. Is yeah. it? Might, and the slug burger, <laughs> slug I think, is, a, is well, another big. It's another big part right of it. Right. Walking through these doors, mm -hmm. what are people going to experience here that they're not going to experience anywhere else? Step back in time. You won't go anywhere and be like this. When they walk out of here, I want them to have experienced a good time and enjoyed the food and come, want them to come back. Yeah, right? <laughs> already, you know, they're coming out already planning I'm their not next trip. We're perfect. We're not perfect every yeah. time. But, oh, yeah. you know, we'll have our issues like everybody well, else. Well, you know, I am perfect, so right. I'll just, I'll carry the perfect flag <laughs> okay. for you, all right? All right. Gotta work, gotta <laughs> you, work. You talk to my wife about me being perfect, <laughs> she'll tell you another story. Yeah, I bet that's right. Well, I appreciate you having us. All right, well, I'm and, glad and, to hey, And I'll say, uh, if you're looking for some healing, come on down to Borum's Drug Store and get yourself a slug burger. That's it. Cheers. <laughs> touched on the electric history here. So now let's take a look at how the University of Mississippi is making history with their installation of the largest roof-mounted solar power complex in the state. All right, so we are uh, up in the clouds. High altitude by Mississippi standards, by Mississippi right? Standards, <laughs> indeed, indeed. Uh, where are we exactly? You are standing on the rooftop of the Haley Barber Center for Manufacturing Excellence at the University of Mississippi, and you're looking at our large solar panel array that we have. And that's that's what these are right Everything here. Behind us. 431 solar panels on our facility that our students get to be the beneficiaries of every day. So is everything going on underneath us, is that being powered by these panels? So on a sunny day, the entire facility can be run on the power that this array creates. Amazing. The lights, the HVAC, our computers, all of that on a sunny day uh, are run by the electricity we're creating with this array. Okay, so what's the goal? Why have all of this? Seems like a lot of work and I'm sure a lot of money and expense. So, uh, right. you know, what's, why? We teach students. Our program is designed to prepare young men and women for careers in manufacturing. If you're going out into manufacturing, whether here domestically in the United States or globally, companies are more and more now having to think about how do we do more with less? How do we create less waste? How do we ingratiate ourselves with communities being lifelong neighbors by figuring out how to use less of the natural resources that they totally. have there in those communities? Smaller footprint. That's right. So as I look out on this roof, are we looking at the future? Are y'all at the forefront and forging a path for this to be a reality for rooftops all over the country? I think I any reasonable person would say that looking at new forms of technology, especially in renewable energy, is something that we're not already doing it, we're going to be doing it in the very near future. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think anybody would say that solar panel technology is not going to be a part of our future. It's very clearly a part of our present. I am not a manufacturer, mm -hmm. so how does this affect me? I think as you see more draw and more uh, strain on our grid systems, mm -hmm. and I think power companies do a great job of, of trying to make sure that people have the power that they need when they need it. I think, you know, even if I'm sitting back on my couch watching a football game, I'm going to actually have to start facing the reality that 
I got to think about the electricity that it's taking to power my television. I got to think about the electricity that it's taking to cool down the frosty beverage that I want to enjoy when I watch that football right. game. And how right. can I, as a consumer of both of those things, provide more value to my home in the long run by incorporating more of this type of technology? It's going to impact all of us individually, one way or the other. And so the more that we can get our students thinking that long-term individual impact, uh, I think the, the better off we're going to be as this technology grows. Cool. Well, let's, uh, let's walk around and Great. check it out. Great. Cool. All right. So, Ron, I'm just curious how you got into all of this. That's a great question. I, I fell into it, quite, quite honestly. Okay. So I, I actually went to law school here at the university, and in 2008, I, I graduated and had every intention of going out and practicing law like a lot of my uh, classmates. But the opportunity presented itself with this brand new program that had just been announced to come and recruit students, continue to bring health to a vibrant manufacturing community in Mississippi, try to get more people involved in the manufacturing process in the mm -hmm. Magnolia State. All right, so what do we have here? So we have a touchscreen monitor that really, for me, this is what students enjoy the most. Okay. Because obviously they can see the panels from the windows upstairs, but they don't really understand exactly the concrete benefit that they get to enjoy with the panel array on our building. So mm -hmm. this breaks it down into things that they can really get behind, especially our cups of coffee. Okay. So if you look at what our uh, 431 solar panels can do, Today, we've generated enough electricity to brew 640 cups of coffee. And you saw what it was like outside. It's dark, it's gray. This is just a reality that even on a cloudy day, the sun is still providing energy that our panels can actually generate into electricity. Right, so right, whether right, it's right. powering 23, 23 homes, homes yeah. or saving some fraction of some trees, yeah. in a day like today, we're still being able to turn that energy into, into usable into electricity. Yeah. This is a great tool for us to teach our students a great technology that's growing and what it means to them in a very real way. I mean, because the thing is, I mean, you just imagine if there were more of these, you know, then right. how it multiplies and multiplies, it's that ripple in the water that just gets bigger and sure. bigger. You can think of how many metropolitan areas that you know that might benefit from 529,000 homes being powered by a solar panel array. Yeah. It really is, and as more and more people tend to, to grow in those urban environments or even in a rural area like this, you can see real quantitative value to what a solar panel array means to the average person. Totally. Mm -hmm. Man, I love what y'all are doing here, I appreciate Ryan. It. We Truly do, do Thank man. You. Thank you for showing us oh. around and my joy. This is great. This is uh, this is an exciting thing for us. And may the sun shine upon you. At some point it might actually come back out. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you Thanks, brother. All right, everybody, so we are in downtown Oxford, Mississippi right now, and we're about to take a quick look about town, and we thought that the best way to do that is riding on a double-decker bus. So look out, Oxford, here we come. Touted as the cultural mecca of the South, Oxford, Mississippi is a picturesque town in north-central Mississippi. It has a rich history, a small town charm, and an active creative community that continues to inspire musicians, artists, and writers. We get our name from uh, Oxford, England, really. Why in the world are we on a double-decker bus, though? In the 90s. We didn't really have anything to bring people into the town, and so uh, really a former mayor is like, well, let's just double down on this whole British thing. And let's see if people like it. Yeah. And so we bought a couple of double-decker buses. Uh, these are original buses from England. Uh, they were in commission back in uh, the 1960s. Wow. Okay. Yeah, and they run like it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, oh, yeah. Smooth takeoff we had Oh, there. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. All the roads are cleared for this double-decker bus. Uh, we had to reshape the entire town, and all of our power lines had to move them up five feet just to be able to put this bus on through because it was just so important that we had the bus. And so, wow. Uh, yeah. But yeah, we've been given tours ever since, and uh, it's kind of given us our character. All this over here is the school. Okay. Uh, it takes up about half a town. This uh, is the Grove right here. Yes, OK. Now, I don't know if y'all have done tailgating anywhere else. You've never done it the same as we do it at the Grove. OK. Uh, we're consistently seen as just the uh, pace de resistance of going to a tailgate, mostly because it's not in the parking lot. Uh, it's in the middle of this uh, big park, and that's where we've been partying since 1848 uh, when we started. Nice. Yeah, this is the oldest is, party in town, right? It really is. The real <laughs> oldest party in the South okay. right here. 
Now we're moving into the actual town of Oxford. Okay. And it's its own animal altogether. There's a lot of things uh, that pull people to Oxford. Uh, Faulkner is a big one. Mm -hmm. uh, John Grisham is a big one. Barry Hanna. All these literary greats uh, pull people from all over who want to make it as a writer. I think, well, there's something to Oxford. Something in the water, right? They're making something out there that, yeah. uh, that works. And so it was, so, it was Faulkner, I guess, the start of that? He didn't just redefine Southern literature, he redefined literature. It was new for its time, and yeah. now it's what we base a lot of our literature on. And then right over here that we're stopping at, that over there is a statue of Faulkner. That is so cool. Let's go see Faulkner. So uh, Faulkner liked to sit and watch people. Okay. His uh, fictional Jefferson, Mississippi was Oxford. Uh, his Yonkapital County was uh, Lafayette County. Uh, the similarities were just too ridiculous not to notice. Okay. Uh, and so a lot of people got written about that didn't necessarily want to be written about. <laughs> uh, but he would gather those stories uh, sitting in a bench right here. So when it comes to that uh, English uh, heritage that I told you about, yes. we try to uh, keep you know people reminded that you know this is little Oxford, this is right. little England, and little uh, e. it even looks like foggy London today. <laughs> <laughs> Super right. cool. William Faulkner's "The Sound and the Fury," "As I Lay Dying," and "Light in August" are just a few of the great works that define Southern literature. And it's clear that the writer's love of the city of Oxford has not gone unrequited. Now we are here at Faulkner's grave. All right. So yeah, let's uh, so go let's down and say and, uh, hello, man. Yeah, give Absolutely. Him a yeah. A lot of uh, cemeteries are places for quiet, places for reflection. Uh, Faulkner, being the disruptive that he is, uh, he left a legacy of the opposite. So this is uh, one of the traditions that you have to do if you're going to be an Oxonian. Okay. You have to come here at night, usually, and pay your respects to the man himself, Faulkner, who uh, really built this city up. Okay. Faulkner liked his whiskey. And, okay. uh, yeah, people felt, well, you know what? He's going to miss it in the grave if nobody brings it to him. So uh, the tradition is you come over here, you uh, take a shot for yourself, you pour a shot on the grave, and then you leave your bottle. Okay. Then in the morning, it's empty. As you can see, all the bottles here they are. They are, yeah. Uh, now, uh, they say that the ghost of Faulkner rises up and uh, takes a shot, but uh, the uh, groundskeeper says it's just the sorority girls, so it's... <laughs> but I'm pretty sure that occasionally he'll uh, make a special occasion like All this All right. One. I'll yep. let you uh, take the first Thank sip. Thank you very much, yeah. Yes. All right. That's the good stuff. Mr. Faulkner. And then one for him. There you are. Cheers, my friend. And then something for a little later. Well, it's official now. Do I? It's official. You're All an right. Oxonian. Good job, man. Awesome, man. Welcome. Thank you Welcome so much. Welcome to the Pride, man. Yeah. I do want to get a picture. Selfie with Faulkner. That's cool, so, man. Yeah, yeah, that's him. Yeah, it's a part of be a, being an Oxonian. The whiskey goes much faster for some reason once you do, <laughs> once you do that tradition. It's like it just disappears. <laughs> right. I certainly cannot leave without seeing where the legendary Faulkner lived and wrote. A lot of people think Roanoke. They think Roanoke, Virginia. Yeah. They think of the one word, Native American word. But Roanoke, it's two words, Rowan Oak. And it's actually named after a mythical tree. It's an old Celtic legend. If you hide under this tree, the Rowan tree, you become invisible, you're protected from evil spirits, and you get this uh, feeling of peace and tranquility. Oh, and wow. as you walk in, you can tell why I named it that. Uh, and that's kind of part of how it survived the war. Uh, Roanoke survived because nobody found it. Oh, wow. It was hidden away for the entire war. Uh, the Northerners never uh, got a hold of it, and so that saved it. And so Faulkner decided, well, surely there has to be magic here. There has to be something yeah. saving it. And so he named it Roanoke, being the oh, literary guy that he cool. is. Oh, yeah. That's a great story. Oh, this is beautiful, man. Talking about uh, ghost tours, this is, uh, this is a place that has a friendly ghost. William Faulkner's uh, friendly presence here at all okay. times. 
Uh, you can uh, go and check out his rose garden where I used to sit and write. Uh, you can uh, go into uh, his uh, writing room. And actually, one time he uh, ran out of paper, and I guess the whiskey did the talking because he had good ideas, and he just started writing all over the walls. So the original notes for A Fable by William Faulkner are actually inscribed on the walls. On the wall. In oh, Roman. Yeah. that is so cool. Walking in the footsteps of Faulkner, oh, yeah. literally. Beautiful, man. Oh, yeah. It's one of our proudest gems. Yeah. Wow, I feel like and we this have is stepped theater. back in time, man. Oh, yeah. Boy, this is time to be here, too, it feels like, you know? Oh, yeah, it's that twilight hour. Here at Oxford, uh, we have a hard time uh, saying goodbye to people, and so I'm just going to say, uh, get out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank but, uh, you so yeah, much, man. Yeah, and it's a lot really of fun. Really appreciate yeah, it, man. Definitely. This has been a blast. As a newly minted Oxonian, I feel worthy of touting the great southern charms of Oxford, Mississippi. Tupelo and Corinth, you won me over as well. Pride in the past and passion for the future abounds here. And that's part of what makes this area a great place to live and a great place to visit. This may have been the first time that Tennessee Valley Uncharted has been here, but I can assure you, it won't be the last.